as Barbara said, what I'm going to be talking about today um, is at the intersection of social epistemology and some issues in criminal law. So um, I'm going to spend you know, a little bit of time at the start of the talk going through some of the um, some of the literature from the legal domain and from the social sciences about false confessions. And then I'm going to apply um, what we learn about false confessions to a phenomenon in philosophy that has gotten a lot, gotten a lot of attention recently called testimonial injustice. Um, so um, to start off with, um, false confessions have long been regarded the gold standard um, in evidence in the United States criminal justice system. So for instance, the US Supreme Court recognized that confession evidence is perhaps the most powerful evidence of guilt admissible in court. This is from Miranda versus Arizona, 1966. So powerful, in fact, that, quote, the introduction of a confession makes the other aspects of a trial in court superfluous. And the real trial, for all practical purposes, occurs when the confession is obtained. Okay? So that is um, you know, showing how the Supreme Court recognized the power of confession evidence. But I think an immediate problem arises for this gold standard in evidence when we look at the prevalence of false confessions. So for the purposes of this talk, we're going to understand a false confession as an admission to a criminal act, which is usually accompanied by a narrative of how and why the crime occurred that the confessor did not commit. Okay. <clears throat> Since 1989, there have been 350, in fact, I, I, this, this talk is forthcoming in a journal called the Journal of Criminal Law and Criminology, and they were just fact-checking my whole paper for me because it's coming out soon. And this number is, has gone up because obviously when I, I think it's 360, I don't know. Anyway, it's gone up since uh, I first wrote it. So, but in any case, we're gonna just stick with the data here. If, when, if any of you end up reading the published version, this number will be different. There have been 353 post-conviction DNA exonerations in the United States. 28% of these involved proven false confessions. Okay. Um, and confessions involve everything from minor infractions to detailed accounts of violent crime, discussing where and with whom and how and so on. Okay. So um, I think that there sometimes is this myth that a false confession is just, I did it. But that's not the case. Oftentimes, they come; they are followed with elaborate stories about how it was done and so on. So in the largest sample ever studied, Drizzen and Leo analyzed 125 cases of proven false confessions in the United States between 1971 and 2002, and found that 81% of them occurred in murder cases, followed by rape and arson. So again, um, you know, there might be this kind of pre-theoretical belief, you know, or pre, you know, kind of looking at the data belief that false confessions occur with like kind of petty crimes or with like minor infractions. But actually when you look at the data, the bulk of them actually cons cons um, concern murder. Okay, so here's the plan for today. Um, I wanna show that false confessions provide what I'm gonna say is a unique and compelling challenge to the current conceptual tools that we have to understand the phenomenon of testimonial injustice. Okay, and I'm going to tell you, you know, how to understand testimonial injustice in a minute. And so I'm going to argue that um, work in the social sciences and in criminal law reveals the need for a, criminal ex for a critical expansion in philosophical discussions. So in this part of the, this kind of dimension of the plan is going to say like, look, philosophy can really benefit from looking at the social sciences and from looking at criminal law. But at the same time, I want to argue that the normative framework that we get from looking at the phenomenon of testimonial injustice provides some really crucial tools for being able to conceptualize what is going on in the cases of false confessions. So this is in a way in which criminal law and the social science scientists can benefit from looking at philosophical work. So I think that it should be a mutually kind of collaborative uh, relationship. Okay, here's the roadmap. The first thing I want to do is show that in the criminal justice system, in the, everything I'm going to say today is restricted to the United States, confession evidence defeats all other evidence, including expert testimony. So the first thing I want to show is I want to show, you know, I'm going to give you a ton of evidence that's going to make the case that confession evidence has this swamping effect, okay, on other evidence. 
And I'm going to argue that's illegitimate. It's an illegitimate swamping effect. The second thing I want to do is argue that we cannot make sense of the unjust ways in which false confessions function in our criminal justice system by focusing entirely as people in the testimonial injustice literature do, by focusing entirely on people getting less credibility than they deserve. So the testimonial injustice literature is focused exclusively on credibility deficits. And I'm gonna argue that we cannot understand what's going on with co false confessions in the criminal justice system by, with this conception of testimonial injustice. We need to expand it, okay? And so I'm gonna conclude that the way that we conceive of testimonial injustice requires a significant expansion in our conceptual resources to include what I call agential testimonial injustice. And agential testimonial injustice is where testimony is extracted from someone in a way that bypasses their agency and then that testimony is given a massive excess of credibility. So the idea is we regard you as a knower. We regard you as a giver of testimony only when we bypass you as an agent and extract information from you. And I'm gonna argue that this is a very distinctive kind of testimonial injustice, one that simply cannot be accommodated in the current framework. Okay, <clears throat> okay so, um, oops, sorry. So um, there are many factors that contribute to false confessions. So I want to spend a little bit of time just talking about some of those factors. All of this is going to be relevant to the conceptual work that we're going to do um, later on. OK, so the first kind of factors are called situational factors. And there are a lot of them, but I'm going to talk about the most dominant situational factors that can um, make a false confession more likely. And the first is the length of the interrogation. So according to guidelines that have been developed for how to avoid getting unreliable information from interrogations, it is advised that a single interrogation session should not exceed four hours. So you should never be inter interrogated continuously for more than four hours at a time, okay? But in that Drizzen and Leo study that I talked about earlier, they found that in cases in which interrogation time was recorded, now you have to keep in mind lots and lots and lots of cases, particularly when things that are problematic are going on, the interrogations are not recorded. My, Steve Drizzen, the person who writes this, is a, a law professor at Northwestern. I know him quite well. And for those of you who um, have watched the Making a Murderer documentary, uh, he's one of the attorneys for Brendan Dassey. So, um, they, they, he and some of his colleagues have pushed very hard in Illinois to make it law that every interrogation has to be recorded from start to finish, and, and it's passed. But there are plenty of states where, where that is still not the case, okay? So you have to just keep in mind, this is studying, you know, looking at inter um, interrogations when it was recorded, okay? So um, when interrogation time, time was recorded, 34% lasted 6 to 12 hours, 39% lasted 12 to 24 hours, and the mean was 16.3 hours, okay? Another factor that contributes that that's situational na in nature is isolation and sleep deprivation, okay? So lengthy interrogations are often accompanied by this. So oftentimes people will be isolated from the people who bring them to the police department. I I've mentioned that I do a lot of work in prisons and one of my students who falsely confessed to a crime at the age of 15 was accompanied to the police station by his father but was then taken into an interrogation room by himself. Okay. Again, now Illinois has done work to, try to make it the case that minors, children, cannot be interrogated without an attorney or a guardian present, but this wasn't always the case. And so um, isolation from significant others, which itself constitutes a form of deprivation, can heighten someone's distress and vulnerability and make it more likely um, to, uh, for the person to want to get out of the situation and therefore to falsely confess. Sleep deprivation is another one. It strongly impairs human functioning, okay, and has been shown to be connected. This one, I think, is the kind of the most appalling, especially for a, uh, an epistemologist. Um, it may, maybe not everybody in this room knows this, but it is legal in the United States for, so false, false confessions have been on people's radars now because of Ava DuVernay's new document, um, new, new, um, docu-series on the Central Park Five and making a murder. And, but I think that before this was part of like kind of general consciousness, I think people would have been more surprised by this, that like you can be in an interrogation room and the police officer can come in and say, 
You explain it. We've got your DNA at the scene of the crime. Tell me how your DNA is there. And people get very flustered. I mean, they don't just, I mean, I think most people in interrogation room just simply don't think, A, that an authority figure would just flat out lie to you in that sort of way. And so what you see happening is they try to make sense out of it. In some of these cases, you'll even see them say things like, I, I don't know, I mean, I, I guess maybe I was like sleepwalking. I mean, they're trying to reconcile this, right? And so um, the presentation of false evidence has been, uh, is directly connected with um, uh, false, false confessions. <clears throat> So here's a case to look at, and I just want to give a content warning before um, I go through the rest of the talk. We will be talking about you know, part particular cases involving murder, involving rape, and some of them will also involve children. So I just want to let everybody know that. Okay, so um, there's, uh, I don't know if any of you are familiar with the case of Marty Tankliff. He now is actually a practicing attorney. But when, um, in 1989, when he, he was accused at the age of 17 of murdering his parents, despite the complete absence of evidence against him. He vehemently, and keep in mind, he's 17, right? He vehemently denied the charges for several hours until his interrogator told him that his hair was found within his mother's grasp, that a humidity test indicated he had showered, hence the presence of only one spot of blood on his shoulder, and that his hospitalized father had emerged from his coma to say that Marty was his assailant all of which were untrue. In fact, his father never regained consciousness and he died shortly thereafter. So following all of this, Tankliff became disoriented, he confessed, but then he immediately recanted. But solely on the basis of that confession, I mean, he didn't do it, so that's all they could have, right? Um, he was convicted and his conviction was vacated and the charges were dismissed 19 years later, okay? Um, so we see in that sort of case, I mean, this is a 17-year-old whose parents were just murdered, right? And then interrogators come in and present this information that his de deceased father woke up and said it was him. You know, I mean, think about how you would be at 17 if you just lost the two most important people in your life and then was being told that your father pointed the finger at you, right? Um, so, um, and the pres that the presentation of false evidence contributes to such confessions is reinforced as well by self-report stories. So people will ask, you know, when people ask, do self-report studies, why did you do it? You know, they'll say, they'll use language like, I felt weighed down by the evidence against me, right? And so what ends up happening too is that a lot of these factors work in combination with one another. So I was recently on a panel on false confessions at our law school, and there was an exonerated man there who was talking about why he falsely confessed. And he was saying that in the interrogation room, they were like put, grabbing his arm and saying, here's where we're gonna use lethal injection. Here's where your mother's gonna see you die. And, and so it worked in connection with like the presentation of false evidence, the weight is against me, I'm gonna get the death penalty. My mother's gonna see me executed. This is the lesser of the two evils, right? So a lot of these tactics work in connection with one another. <clears throat> the last um, uh, factor is um, minimization tactics. So there's three different ways that the, um, these tactics are used. One is where you minimize the moral consequences of confessing. Second, you minimize the psychological consequences of confessing. And the third is you minimize the legal consequences of, of, of confessing. So here are some examples. The interrogator may offer sympathy. So this would be minimizing the moral consequences. I would have done the same thing, right? So imagine like a domestic violence case, right? I mean, did she cheat on you? I would have done it too. You probably just went crazy, right? I get it. I would have done the same. You know, so they kind of minimize the moral wrong, you know, the kind of the moral, um, you know, uh, wrongness of it. Um, the interrogator might also, also min um, offer minimizing explanations of the crime such as that the murder was spontaneous or accidental, right? It was probably just a crime of passion or something. And might communicate promises through pragmatic implication that the suspect will be punished less severely if he or she confesses. So it is illegal to make an outright promise that you cannot keep, but they can, like, like what I just was describing with the man on the panel, right? I mean, like, look, we'll go easy on you. We won't go for the death penalty. You know, these sorts of things that like, you know, this is gonna be the lesser of two evils if you confess. Okay, there are also dispositional factors that are related to false confessions. Juvenile status and mental impairment. 
Okay, so um, juveniles and those with mental impairment, including those with developmental disabilities and mental illness, are wildly overrepresented in the population of proven false confessions. So of the first 200 DNA exonerations in the United States, 35% of the false confessors were 18 years or younger and or had a developmental disability. In their sample of wrongful convictions in this 2005 study, they found that 44% of the exonerated juveniles and 69% of exonerated persons with mental disabilities were wrongly convicted because of false confessions. And so there are a number of factors at work here. Um, you know, not being able to comprehend the, 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 the significance of it, not being able to understand what it is to waive your Miranda rights. So there are all sorts of, if, if for those of you who have watched the Making a Murder documentary, Brendan Dassey had both, right? He was a juvenile and he had, um, you know, kind of a mental impairment, right? So um, he was, you know, kind of had both of these, you know, um, dispositional factors that ma made him susceptible um, to falsely confessing. Um, his attorneys have um, exhausted their legal options for him, and they are now uh, just filed for clemency to the governor of Wisconsin. And one of the things that his attorney was recently saying, not Steve Drizzen, his other attorney, Laura Nyrider, was that when he was at school, he needed to have someone sit next to him to explain the material to him, right? And yet he was left alone in that interrogation room as a child, right? So I mean, you know, just to kind of emphasize, you know, I mean, he needed someone sitting next to him to understand literature and math, but he was left alone in a, in a situation like that. Interestingly, false confessions are often facilitated by the very innocence of the person, right? So if you are innocent, then you are ta you're, you're ex eager to talk. Imagine it's also a loved one. You want them to catch the person who did this. You want justice, right? So you're much more likely to sit down, to waive your Miranda rights, to not ask for an attorney. And then the more you talk, the more they catch you in minor inconsistencies. They start bringing up those inconsistencies. You get flustered. It leads to bigger inconsistencies and so on. Okay. So interestingly, the very you know, kind of innocence of a person can also um, increase the likelihood of false confessions. Okay, so that's a little bit of background about false confessions. I now wanna switch gears and talk to you about the phenomenon of testimonial injustice, and then we're gonna bring them together. Okay. So testimonial injustice, some of you were in the class earlier today, so I already kind of went over some of this. Um, it has three features of it um, in the way that it's kind of widely used in the literature. Okay, so a lot of this is coming kind of from a, you know, a book by Miranda Fricker um, called Epistemic Injustice, and um, testimonial injustice is one kind of epistemic injustice. And it's standardly understood to have three central features, okay? The first is that you get a credibility deficit, and what that means is you get less credibility, you're regarded as less of a credible person than the evidence says you are. Second, this is done because of a bias on the part of your hearer. And third, it's a bias that targets your social identity. Okay? Classic example, woman goes to a police station, reports a sexual assault. Police officer doesn't believe her. Okay? He has no evidence for discounting her. He just says women lie about sexual assault. Okay? It's a bias that he has. He's not grounding this in evidence. In fact, the evidence shows that women don't, you know, kind of generally lie about sexual assault. So he's not grounding this in evidence. It's a bias. It's targeting her social identity as a woman. And she, as a result, is getting less credibility than she deserves. OK, that would be a paradigmatic example of testimonial injustice. OK, now um, Fricker in particular is interested in the kind of testimonial injustice that is systemic. So she's interested in social identities that track people through many different aspects of their life. So suppose, for instance, that someone just has a real bias against people who wear pink shirts, right? And so you show up in a pink shirt and you just say something, you know, that, you know, you, that you're knowledgeable about and they don't believe you because you're wearing a pink shirt. She's not as interested in that kind of testimonial injustice. She's interested in the kind that will follow you in the bakery and the gas station and, you know, kind of the, the you know, the, the, the bank, right? And so she really does focus on race and gender, 
Okay. Whether these exhaust the kinds of social identity that are systemic is an open question, but these are the cases that she's most kind of interested in. The ones where you systematically are you know, kind of denied a voice in the epistemic community. Okay? Does that relate to color too? Color of the person? Black? Yes. 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 Yep. Um, okay, so um, on this model, the distinctive wrong that you suffer when you are the victim of testimonial injustice is a distinctive epistemic wrong. So one of the things that's interesting is that like, she really is not giving a moral analysis here. or a, She really says you're, dis, you're wronged in your capacity as a knower. Okay? Um, and that's one of, that's the way, that's like kind of the diagnosis she gives of what's problematic um, when you um, are the victim of testimonial injustice. Now, Fricker is very clear that she thinks, and, and people who have followed her have, have agreed with this, um, even people who have critiqued her view in other ways, that only deficits can give rise to testimonial injustice. Okay, and let me give you a little bit about like her reasoning for this. So she's interested in the distinctive kind of wrong that you suffer at the moment of the testimonial exchange. So she says, look, there are all sorts of ways in which excesses can give rise to testimonial injustice in this like long-term sort of way. If people are constantly unjustifiably deferring to you, you might become immodest. You might become uh, close-minded, right? It might lead to the cultivation of these epistemic vices or something like that. Or it could actually kind of burden you in the long run. Everybody's coming to you, you know, to help them out, okay? So these are kind of long-term ways. But she doesn't think that getting more than your share wrongs you in that particular instance, like in and of itself, as a knower, okay? And one of the ways that she grounds this is in her rejection of what, what I call a distributive model of credibility, okay? So she argues that credibility is not the sort of thing that is properly understood as being finite in nature. So like if I have a pizza and I give five pieces to Amy, I'm necessarily gonna have fewer for the rest of you. Credibility isn't like that. I can give way more to some, and she says, I still have plenty to give to the rest of you. Credibility is infinite in this sort of way, okay? And that's what motivates her to argue that excesses can't be problematic, right? It's not like, typically when we are saying like, why is it wrong to give someone else more? Well, because others get less. And she says, that's not the case here, right? Credibility is infinite. So in order to give someone more that doesn't necessitate that others get less, you're not wronged in this distinctive way as a knower when you get more, okay? Um, now here's what I want to claim in the paper. I want to say that when the testimony of a confessing self is privileged over a recanting self because of prejudice, whether it's racial or otherwise, this results in a unique kind of testimonial injustice that is due to a credibility excess. So I want to talk, um, for the rest of the talk, about understanding this notion, right? That I'm gonna say, this, this conceptual framework does not give us the tools to understand what's going on in cases of false confessions. Okay. So I want to start by focusing on some features of false confessions to get um, <clears throat> this off the ground. So the first thing is that false confessions are highly resistant to counter evidence. And this is relevant because when Fricker is interested in the specific kind of bias that's operative in cases of testimonial injustice, she understands bias in terms of resistance to counter evidence. Okay, or resistance like kind of floats freely from evidence, right? A bias isn't a bias if it's sufficiently grounded in evidence, right? Bias is a bias because it's disconnected from evidence, right? And so one of the things that's really interesting to note is just how resistant to counter evidence false confessions are, okay? <clears throat> so despite awareness, I think there's been a lot more work about the reality and the prevalence of false confessions, as well as their causes and effects, a lot of what I went over at the start of this talk, False confessions are still frequently taken to be sufficient for grounding convictions. 
And this occurs even when there's powerful evidence on behalf of the defendant's innocence, and the stakes are, you know, couldn't be higher. Okay, so I want to talk about a couple of cases to kind of make this vivid. Okay, so this is the case of Juan Rivera. Um, he actually is, is from Illinois and was um, exonerated ultimately by the Center on Wrongful Convictions at Northwestern. Okay. So he was convicted of the rape and murder of an 11-year-old girl in Waukegan, Illinois, on the basis of his confession, even after DNA testing of semen at the scene excluded him. So the state's theory of why DNA belonging to someone other than the defendant was found in the victim was that the young girl had prior consensual sex with an unknown male, after which time Rivera raped her, failed to ejaculate, and then killed her. Okay, so she was 11 years old. There was no evidence of any prior relationships, okay? She was 11, so she couldn't have a consensual relationship anyway, right? Um, and so rather than going out and looking for the, cons the, the the person who, you know, she was having this so-called relationship with, um, this was the state's theory about why Juan Rivera's semen was not found in her and someone else's semen was, okay? We might think that these are horrible people, but I also think that one thing that we need to think about is just how powerful confession evidence is for people, right? When we look at this, and I think I'm gonna say this on another slide, when someone confesses to a crime, oftentimes the investigation just stops. Think about other, invest other investigations. If you find a fingerprint, if you find a bloody glove, if you find this, the investigation doesn't stop. But they close, they close their books and walk out of the interrogation when we're done. They're not continuing on the streets looking for someone else, right? It's incredibly powerful evidence, okay? So the fact that Rivera was convicted of the child's murder shows that the state's outrageous theory was regarded as more credible than the possibility that, that he confessed to a crime he didn't commit. In other words, a single confession trumped evidence that would otherwise be taken to be decisively exculpatory. Okay, here's another one. Lest you think that that's like, so for those of you who watched the um, When They See Us, how many of you have watched that? the docuseries, I mean, if you remember, tell me, what did they say when um, they said, look, none of the DNA matches the five people, the five young men, what did she say? There must have been a sixth. It doesn't mean they're innocent, there must have been a sixth. So we see this over and over. Okay, so here's another case. He recently passed away, by the way, Billy Wayne Cope, while still incarcerated. In the 2004 case of South Carolina against Billy Wayne Cope, Cope woke up one morning to find his 12-year-old daughter strangled to death in her bed. Police identified Cope as the perpetrator and interrogated him for several stressful hours, during which time they told him that he failed a lie detector test and used other well-known interrogation tactics that put innocent people at risk. After two and a half days, he eventually confessed in a statement that was filled with contradictions and factual errors. Shortly thereafter, it was revealed that Cope's daughter was also sexually assaulted. Subsequent DNA tests revealed that the semen and saliva found on the girl's body did not match him, but it did match James Sanders, a serial sex offender who had broken into other homes in the area. One would think from this series of events that he would have been released from jail and compensated, but instead the prosecutor, armed with a police-induced confession that did not match the facts of the crime, charged Cope with conspiracy and theorized that he had pimped his daughter out to Sanders. Despite the fact that there was no known connection between Cope and Sanders. Okay. <clears throat> um, in 2010, the Center for Wrongful Convictions at Northwestern identified 19 cases in which confessors to rape and or murder were tried and convicted despite having been excluded by DNA tests of key biological materials. Okay? So these are the cases in which there is DNA evidence, like we saw in the When They See Us case, right, in the Central Park Five, and the, the, they just theorize, well, there must have been a sixth, or you know, he pimped her out, or she was this 11-year-old child had a relationship that nobody knew about, right? <clears throat> okay. So I want to say the most plausible explanations for these type of cases is that false confessions are receiving a massive, unwarranted excess of credibility. Okay. <clears throat> so that's the claim I want to make. Okay. 
So the totality of the evidence against confessions is often substantial in lots of these kinds of cases, while the evidence in their favor is remarkably thin. So let's go back to the Juan Rivera case. So the evidence in his favor wasn't just the DNA that excluded him. It was also when we look at the factors, so this is why I wanted to spend some time going over the factors that lead to false confessions. He was a 19-year-old former special education student who had been questioned by detectives for four days, during which he steadfastly denied any knowledge of the crime. Around midnight on the fourth day after the interrogators became accusatory, I'm gonna read this, he broke down and purportedly nodded when asked if he had raped and killed the 11-year-old girl. The interrogation continued until 3 a.m. when investigators left to type a confession for him to sign. Minutes later, jail personnel saw him beating his head against the wall of his cell in what was later termed a psychotic episode. Nevertheless, within a few hours, he signed the typed confession. The document was riddled with you know, inc incorrect and implausible information, so the Lake County State's attorney instructed investigators to resume the interrogation to clear up the inconsistencies. So rather than seeing this and thinking, oh my gosh, maybe this is an innocent man, they sent it back and said, get a coherent statement. They went back, re-interviewed him despite the fact that he had just had a psychotic break, um, and it resulted in a second signed confession confession, which included a plausible account of the crime. Okay. <clears throat> so um, he had three separate jury trials. He was found guilty and sentenced to life all three times. It wasn't until the Center on Wrongful Convictions became involved that in 2012, his conviction was ruled unjustified and that it cannot stand. And the state dismissed all charges. He had already served 20 years in prison at this point. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So, um, a couple of things I want to just note. Um, this is just if you want a philosophical framework for understanding this. I'm not going to go into this into too much detail. I am an epistemologist after all, so I'm going to kind of walk you through this a little bit. But in standard contemporary epistemology dis discussions, um, knowledge is taken to be incompatible, or rational belief is taken to be incompatible with what's sometimes called defeaters. Defeaters is just a fancy name for counter evidence. Okay? But not all counter evidence defeats our, the, just, the rationality of our beliefs, right? There's all sorts of counter evidence, right? I mean, you, you, know, like you might read the counter, you, there might be counter evidence from a palm reader, right? And you might not think that that's a defeater, right? A defeater is counter evidence that rises to the level of defeating your rationality or defeating your knowledge, okay? So not all counter evidence does that. So there are typically two different kinds. There are, this, there's counter evidence that targets directly the content of your belief. So this would be the DNA evidence, would be what's called a dogsastic defeater, right? The DNA evidence is saying this belief is false, that he committed this crime, right? It's specifically targeting the propositional content of the belief. But then there's also what are sometimes called, what do I have up there? Yes, um, undercutting defeaters, which undermine the reliability of the source. So suppose that you find, like you go to your doctor, prescribes a medication for like a new prescription, then you go online and you find out that he's getting a lot of money from the pharmaceutical company that he just wrote. It just might like give you pause, right? You just might be like, huh, I'm just not sure this is super reliable, right? Think about all of the undercutting defeaters that every person in the criminal justice system that started in that interrogation room and led to three convictions for Juan Rivera had, right? 19-year-old special education student, had, was in the middle of a psychotic break, had been interrogated for multiple days, had, gave confession that was riddled with inconsistencies, right? They had massive amounts of evidence. And you might think like, okay, she's just repeating the obvious, but here's something that I want you to think about. In epistemology and in everyday life, we don't think that we need to assess people's reliability when they are confessing. We assess people's reliability all the time. Is this true or is this false? How, you know, how well positioned is this person to say this? When someone says, I did it, is the first thing you think like, well, are you a reliable testifier about that? I just don't know. I don't know, were you there? Right? You just assume that the person is in a privileged position. They were there, they did it. They wouldn't be saying it otherwise. And what I'm trying to draw our attention to is it's testimony just like any other testimony and it needs to be assessed 
along these dimensions, right? We don't assess the reliability of people when they are confessing to things, okay? And that's what has led to some of these problems. I mean, life-changing, life-destroying problems, right? These aren't minor problems. <clears throat> okay, so this is me just kind of going through what I just went through. <clears throat> and then the DNA is a rebutting defeater. You don't need to know all this language. Okay. Um, so when someone has a defeater, when someone has counter evidence that rises to the level of defeating the rationality or justification, the only way you can be in an epistemically okay position, right, a rational position, is if you have counter counter evidence, right? So someone comes up to me and says, hey, the police, uh, sorry, the doctor is being paid, yes, he's getting money from the pharmaceutical companies, um, but he didn't actually even know that this prescription that he just signed for you was you know, manufactured by that pharmaceutical company. Okay, that's a defeater defeater, right? Your suspicion has now a turn been defeated. And you can believe that it's trustworthy again, right? But think about the evidence we have here, right? Are there any defeater defeaters here that are present, right? There's simply no way in which the outrageous theories that are proposed over and over again in these sorts of cases defeat the, the, count, the evidence that, we, that, we have, you know, that we've just listed, okay? So basically, I don't think that we can tell a story in these sorts of cases where there's a defeater defeater. Okay. So one of the things that's really fascinating about false confessions, and again, I think it's just treated as a totally unique kind of testimony, is that um, a false confession is often given only once. Not always, but often. Once in an interrogation room. And then someone will recant for 20 years, oftentimes beginning the minute they leave the interrogation room and they are in the arms of their loved ones. You all, if you've watched the Making a Murder documentary, you saw that the minute Brendan Dassey's mother walked into the interrogation room. How many of you have watched that? Just so I'm not talking to like nobody. Has anybody? Okay. Anyway, the minute that his, the police officers leave and his mother walks into the interrogation room, the minute he puts his head down in his hands and he says, they got inside my head. Right? Right? The minute. And so you have cases in which a single instance of testimony swamps decades of instances of testimony, right? And so just even if we're looking at just the numbers, right? Just the numbers. And one of the things I oftentimes talk about in my work is I talk about recanting selves and I talk about confessing selves because I think selves in the plural give different testimony. My 20-year-old self gave different testimony than my 30-year-old self gives. Okay? And I give the analogy about how testimony of victims of sexual assault oftentimes are ignored until the numbers rise to like 200 people, right? Like think of Nasser, think of you know, Sandusky, right? Think about um, you know, uh, Bill Cosby, right? A lot of these cases, it's not enough unless there's just lots and lots of numbers. And what I'm saying is we should similarly view 20 years of recantations as a lot of numbers, right? That's a 19-year-old self, and a 20-year-old self, and a 21-year-old self, and a 22-year-old self. Those are all instances of testimony, right? And again, we're left with this, why does this one moment in time, right, um, have such a, a, a swamping effect? <clears throat> okay. Um, we can just, I, I, um, like, I'm taking a while, so I need to kind of pick up the pace here. Um, okay, so one of the things that, um, sorry, I don't have my little thing here, which is why I'm kind of just going through them all like this, because I like to kind of walk around. I don't want to have to keep walking back to the laptop. Um, okay, so I think one of the things that we see is the model that we used to reject um, an excess of credibility being able to give rise to testimonial injustice was that credibility is an infinite good. And that um, it cannot be understood on a distributive model. And I don't think that this is generally correct about credibility. Um, there's no way that you can say to a confessing self and a recanting self, I believe both of you, right? 
especially when it happens like seconds after the confession. You might say like, well, psychological changes have happened over time and maybe they, maybe they do both, are both, I don't know, can't both be true. But in any case, um, if you believe one, then the other's a liar, right? It's not like it's this infinite good, like enough for everyone, right? No, someone is a truth teller and someone is a liar, right? <clears throat> and I think that when we think about um, the distribution of credibility, we tend to think of this as a, dis a specifically interpersonal concern, right? I've got someone saying P and I've got someone saying not P and which person do I believe, right? But I think we need to take this model and think about it with, this, with different kind of selves, right? You've got the confessing self and you've got the recanting self. And the question becomes, which self do we believe? And if we start thinking about these as different instances of testimony, we're gonna see that the evidence overwhelmingly typically favors the recanting self, right? In these sorts of cases. Okay, so um, the next thing I wanna do is um, suggest that there's a very particular kind of testimonial injustice that we can understand um, false confessions fitting under. And I call it um, agential testimonial injustice. So if you remember, the distinctive wrong of testimonial injustice is supposed to be that you're wronged in your capacity as a knower. That's what it is. Okay, that's the, the normative analysis. And I think in these sorts of cases, you are distinctively wronged in your capacity as a knower. And the reason for this is because especially when you think about juxtaposing these two different selves that I keep calling, right? You, the only knower between these two is the one that is um, testified under conditions of manipulation, deception, sleep deprivation, coercion, intimidation, fear, and so on, right? The state is telling people, you are a knower only in so far as we can extract your testimony from you, right? And extracting testimony in these sorts of ways bypasses people's epistemic agency, I think, in crucial ways. It also probably just bypasses their agency more broadly, but I, as an epistemologist, focus mostly on the epistemic agency that it bypasses. And so what the state is saying is that you are a knower only when we bypass your epistemic agency and extract testimony from you. And then we give that this massive credibility excess. And then when you're with your loved ones and you've gotten some sleep, right, and you're away by yourself and you recant for 20 years, that's when you're a liar, right? And so I think that this is a distinctive kind of testimonial injustice that the traditional model cannot accommodate. And so one of the things that I think is, um, well, first let me just say, I think that there's like an instructive parallel here that's kind of powerful. So in ancient Athens, enslaved persons were te and testified in judicial proceedings only under torture. Okay. So they were regarded as credible. This was just the standard practice, right? So they were regarded as credible only when their testimony was extracted through interrogation techniques that undermine their epistemic agency. Okay. So they were only regarded as being in the realm of givers of knowledge, givers of information, if they were literally tortured into testifying. And I think by analogy, confessing selves are often vulnerable members of society, juvenile, juveniles, people with developmental impairments, targets of racism and sexism. And they are told, you are only a giver of information and giver of information about yourself when we engage in these sorts of tactics. Many of which, I mean, keep in mind, I'd even talk about full-blown torture. I'm from Chicago, right? John, I mean, I don't know if any of you know, like the famous John Burge cases where, I mean, he was like electrocuting men's testicles to get actual, I mean, I have in, in the prison that I work in, like lots of John Burge torture. I'm not even talking about that kind of torture. Right? Just talking about interrogation techniques, right? That is an interrogation technique. But I mean, um, I mean, those cases are like straightforwardly ones. I mean, unless you believe that John Burge and all of the people who were following his instructions were absolute just moral monsters and did not care at all about the truth, right? So that they were just torturing people to say they did it, knowing full well they didn't. Maybe that's true, 
But I also think that there are lots of people, including the United States government, that believes that actually torture brings out the truth in people. It's been empirically shown over and over to not. I mean, if you started like pulling off my fingernails, I mean, I'm sure I would say all sorts of things, you know what I mean? Um, and so, um, but there is this long standing belief. This, this book that I read about the torture in ancient Athens, I got really fascinated by it. But it really is the history of this idea that can, you know, kind of that you can torture confessions out of people and that that's, a reli that's the reliable way. And obviously, it was especially used on enslaved persons because they're, 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 they're less people, right? They're lesser people. Um, and so I'm saying by analogy, we can see something very similar in, the, in today's criminal justice system. So here's an account. A speaker is the victim of agential, what I'm calling agential testimonial injustice, when testimony that has been obtained in a way that denies or bypasses her epistemic agency is afforded an unwarranted credibility excess. Okay? So that's, you know, kind of basically all that amounts to is if I extract information from you in a way that is manipulative or coercive, okay, and then I say that's your true knowing self in an unwarranted way which most of the time it is, then I'm saying you're the victim of agential testimonial injustice. <clears throat> I think there are two distinct kinds of wrongs that accompany this notion. The first involves the, the excess itself. And here one is epistemically wrong by virtue of being regarded as a testifier, a giver of knowledge only when one's testimony is extracted and you know, is, is pr the product of a process that subverts your agency. And the second is the very act of extracting testimony from a speaker in a way that subverts her epistemic agency. Unfortunately, just given the time, I'm not gonna be able to go. This per distinctive feature of the wrong gets deep into epistemology. So um, I basically um, kind of argue in the paper that this talk is from is um, that the very act of the extraction um, by, is incompatible with standard notions of epistemic agency, where epistemic agency, one standard notion of it is reasons responsiveness. So you are exercising epistemic agency when you have the capacity to be reasons responsive. And if I'm literally extracting the information from you, then I am not allowing you to be reasons responsive. And the very act, so the first one is the excess, and the second one is the very extraction is preventing you from being an epistemic agent in this reasons responsive kind of way. Okay. So the next thing I wanna do in conclusion is I just wanna ask the interesting question. Why are confessing selves given a credibility excess in the first place? Okay. And I want to just pause for a minute and say, think about how crucial it is to ask this question. It's not enough to ask why recanting selves are regarded as liars. You don't get wrongful convictions from simply giving a deficit to recanters. You need the confession for the conviction. The confession is usually the, old, the, the main piece of evidence that the conviction is, you know, kind of hangs on. It's crucial that we ask the question, why are confessors regarded as truth tellers, right? Because the recanters being liars is not sufficient to understand wrongful convictions, okay? So uh, the first thing is, I'm sure something you all have already thought about, and it's the psychological factor, that it's difficult to imagine ourselves doing it. And this is especially true when something like a violent crime is at issue, like murder or rape, right? We're all sitting here. I was saying earlier when we were talking that I just gave this talk, um, I don't know, like a week or two ago, I don't know. And it was, a, you know, I, I said to the audience, like how many of you say, I, are sitting in the audience saying, I would never, and like a ton of people raised their hands and said, I, no, there's just no, nothing you could do to get me to confess to a murder I didn't commit. Um, when you look at the le literature, um, though, um, it's very easy to get people to falsely confess to things, okay? So I'm just going to very quickly kind of go through some of this. So this was one of the first most well-known experiments in, from 1996. 69% of college students who were falsely accused of causing a computer to crash by pressing a key that they were specifically told to avoid. Like, and it was over here. It was over here. Like, don't go near this. Don't do this. And then people would come in and say, like, you did it. You pressed that button. 69% you could get eventually get a false confession out of. 
Okay. When false evidence is presented of guilt, this percentage is higher. And it's not uncommon for suspects to even come to believe in their own guilt. So people start to internalize this. So these are called internalized false confessions. This is a re more recent one. So Nash and Wade used digital editing software to fabricate evidence of participants stealing money from a bank. When presented with this evidence, every subject signed the confession. Every single one. So if you, and so this is especially worrisome when you think about deep fakes coming, right, and becoming increasingly, right, our technology being able to have like Obama and Trump and saying things that just our eyes are telling us they said that. He declared war. He did this, right? And when you think about how compelling we find seeing something with our own eyes, right, if you see it with your own eyes, so this, when people were presented with video, look, there, there you are. There's your shirt, right? There's your ring. That looks like you, right? 100% signed the false confession, okay? So the authors concluded that a combination, and wait, just quickly, 63% um, fully internalized the act, so came to fully believe that it was then 20 partially internalized it. The authors concluded that a combination of social demand, phony evidence, and false suggestion from a credible source can lead a substantial, indeed substantial, number of people to falsely confess and believe they committed an act they never did. So this is just, I think, an interesting kind of manifestation of this. It's the case of Michael Crow. After a series of interrogation sessions, during which time police um, presented Crow with compelling false physical evidence of his guilt that he had killed his sister, who was in the bedroom down the hall. Okay, they presented him with all of this false evidence that he had done this. He concluded that he was a killer, saying, I'm not sure how I did it, all I know is I did it. Eventually he was convinced that he has a split personality, that bad Michael acted out of a jealous rage while good Michael blocked the incident from his memory. The charges against Crow were later dropped when a drifter in the neighborhood that night was found with his sister's blood on his clothing. <clears throat> so very powerful way, in, you know, kind of which you can even come to fully believe and tell a narrative about how this happened. The other reason why false confessions are so powerful is because they affect the perceptions of others. So, um, you know, um, including, you know, this is when we're talking about the criminal justice system, eyewitnesses, alibi witnesses, forensic experts. So in one study, 61% of those who had witnessed a stage theft changed their identifications after learning that certain lineup members had confessed. So, you know, suppose the, the, the study would go like this, right? I say, Here, there's my laptop, and they say, um, okay, everybody, make sure no one steals that laptop. And we're all in here, we're watching it, right? No one takes the laptop. Then they come in there and they're like, Amy took the laptop, right? And we're like, no, she didn't. I, mean, I was watching it the whole time, right? Like, she didn't take that. They're like, she confessed. People be like, oh, yeah, maybe she took the laptop, right? Just hearing that someone confessed to something is powerful for us, right? Right? Um, Okay, yeah. So what this shows is that false confessions not only mislead in the first instance, but they beget additional misleading evidence downstream. Okay. And another factor, 85% of juvenile exonerees who falsely confessed are African American. So there's obviously a lot of racial prejudice and bias in the criminal justice system, in the interrogation room, in the courtroom. Okay. Another thing that's at, kind of at work, I'd like to believe this does not play a huge role. I'd like to believe that not people, I keep saying like that people aren't moral monsters, right? Um, but like the practical interests of those responsible for securing justice often lead them intentionally or unintentionally to weigh confessions far too heavily, to disregard exculpatory evidence, and to rely on incredible theories to support their conclusions, okay? So, this is like, again, so many cases from Illinois, right? My good old, you know, good old Illinois. This was a widely discussed 60 Minutes interview that then state's attorney, Anita Alvarez, gave. And it was called Chicago, the False Confessions Capital. So they were interviewing Anita Alvarez saying, why are there so many false confessions in Chicago, right? <clears throat> And she discussed the case of the Dixmore Five, in which DNA evidence ruled out five defendants who had falsely confessed to the rape and murder of a 14-year-old girl. 
after they served a total of 95 years behind bars. All five were exonerated in 2011. And in fact, the Illinois State Police settled a civil rights case brought on their behalf for a record $40 million. That was in 2013. Moreover, the semen found inside the 14-year-old matched Willie Randolph, who was a convicted rapist with 39 arrests. So she's doing this interview, right? And they're like, okay, so look, you know, you guys gave her 40 million. They found this other guy, right? And they served a total of 95 years behind bars. Here's your moment, Anita. Say you're sorry, you know, say your office made a mistake. When she was asked about this case in 2015, she said that it was still possible that the five defendants raped and murdered the girl and that Randolph wandered past the field where her body was and committed an act of necrophilia. FYI, when I gave this talk um, last, last week or wherever I was, there was a prosecutor in the audience, and he was doing this kind of thing, right? I mean, he was arguing, like, I knew this one case where in the morgue someone had raped the body, and I was like, okay, that's one case, you know? And, um, I mean, he, he was literally doing this in my talk, you know, this, this kind of argument. Okay, so conclusion, false confessions are a new agential form of testimonial injustice and it occurs because credibility can be a finite good. It results when excess credibility is given to the confessing self in conditions that undermine epistemic agency and credibility is withheld from the recanting self. In such cases, the state is quite straightforwardly saying to its citizens, you are worthy of being believed only when we bypass your agency and extract information from you through coercive or man manipulative methods. That this is a particularly pernicious form of testimonial injustice carried out by institutions in which we place our trust cries out for a radical change in the epistemic lens through which we view confessions in the criminal justice system. Thanks.